I'll fly away because one glad morning we're going to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship him. Amen. many different avenues, many different ways of trying to fix yourself and uh, bring fruit in your life, be happy and successful. Amen. The only way is through Jesus Christ. He can turn your graves into gardens. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough.
my failures. My failures and all. Lord, you've seen them all. And you still call me friend. God. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and
God will protect me one last time. God will protect me and bring me dominion. He will give destiny and fruitfulness by what He has Lisa Mitchell. We're going to also pray for Pastor Jesse and Bethany Morales, all our uh, leaders and associate pastors in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, let's pray for the Cassios, the Galvans, the Hearts, 
and pray for Paul and Linda Campo also in the East Coast. In Cape Cod, let's also pray for uh, Chip and Lori Guineer, all the ex excellent work that they're doing there in the Cape. Amen. They have several churches that have been planted out. Disciples have been raised up. And let's pray for those works to be effective, self-supporting, and producing much fruit. Let's also remember to pray for the Suspanskis and the Kings and the Spicers in Jacksonville. Amen. Let's also remember to pray for my pastor, Keith, and Carrie Sullivan his wife and all the great things that are happening in Rochester with the disciples and uh, people are rising up for ministry and uh, making an impact in their generation. I'd like to also remember to pray for uh, Matt and Sarah Stoll in Syracuse. This is their last night of the grand opening. Pastor Keith Sullivan is there and let's pray for many visitors. Let's pray for success. Uh, bodies to be healed and lives to be changed. Amen. We're also going to remember to pray for the uh, conference that's coming up um, in a few weeks, uh, the Prescott International Bible Conference. I'm going to ask you to pray for fanning the flame. Amen. That God gets a hold of people. Amen. Refreshing and anointing upon this service. Let's also go ahead and pray for uh, these local needs here. I want to pray for Ellis Newton, a fellow I prayed with last night at Walmart. Uh, let's pray for his family to get saved. Uh, uh, three brothers also prayed with me last night, Brandon, CJ, and Edwin. Let's pray that the Holy Ghost brings them to church this upcoming week. Uh, we're going to pray for Jesus and Fatima and pray uh, lifting up Rick Ifaldi, amen, and uh, Chase from Buffalo Wild Wings in Providence, Rhode Island has a brand new church Amen. They need help. They need the Holy Spirit to bless them. Let's go ahead and pray for Debbie and Gina and Michael to come back to church and all our police officers and firefighters and active military. And remember also to pray lastly for David Bergsman. He's not feeling good tonight. We're going to pray that God gives him strength and we'll see you back on Wednesday night. Let's go ahead and pray. And uh, maybe there's a need in your life that I did not mention yet. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand as a sign to me that you need God. Amen. Uh, amen. I see some hands going up. Praise God. We're going to pray for you and your uh, whatever specific request is. We don't need to know it, but we're going to ask you to pray and you call out to God in that time when we have an opportunity and you pray. We're going to pray with you and we're going to believe God for all these and more. And let's go ahead and pray. I'm going to open this up when we're done. God, we thank you for a revival. God, we thank you for getting a hold of people, God. Show them, uh, God, what a waste of time this life is, God. I pray for revelation, God, to be furthered, God. Let life be given. Let people awaken to your righteousness, God. I pray for our leadership, God. I pray how Pastor Greg, uh, and I pray for Pastor Jesse Morales, God. And I also lift up, amen, what you're doing in uh, the Syracuse work. God, give them favor, God, those people that got saved this morning. I pray you would... Help them and bless them and bring them back tonight, God. Give them visitors uh, and God establish people in that place. Give them pillars. Amen. Right now we come to you by the blood of Jesus. And in Jesus' name we call out to you, God. We are desperate. Uh, we have needs. We have requests. God, I pray you touch every individual here, God. Baptize them in the Holy Ghost. With the evidence of speaking in tongues, according to Acts 2, 4, God, I pray. And I pray, God, give them comfort and boldness, God, as they walk with Jesus, God. I pray for the effects of uh, our revival with Ralph Blanco. Bless my brother, God. Bless uh, those who got saved last week and those who were healed in their bodies. I'm praying for miracles, God. Touch those uh, who we've lifted up before heaven, God, I pray. Move upon every unspoken request here, Lord, God. Touch uh, the individual needs, God, I pray. Move in finances, God. Move in revelation, God. Move in people's bodies. Heal them if they're sick. And I pray, I pronounce blessing unto this place, God. I pronounce blessing unto yes. every individual. And I believe you, God, for the town of Greece, revival, Lord God, according to your perfect plan, God. Make Rochester a net for the nations, God. Give us all nationalities, God. Yes. Koreans, Asians, uh, and Vietnamese. Give us Africans, Lord God. Latinos, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. Uh, and God, you flood this place with a great diversity, God. We so... Thank you for what you're going to do, God. And we ask you all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God. Let's give him glory. Yeah. 
Amen. Praise God. Let's take a minute to greet one another and make everybody feel welcome tonight. Hallelujah. It's good to see you. Good to be seen. Good to be seen. Ah, gotcha. What is your name? Tom. Tom, I'm Colleen. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in. No problem. Yeah. Okay. You need to gather with everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. First, I can talk about the girls. Roll the board in. In a car. Let's see, man. Good to see you. Is it okay, yeah? Okay. I think he's almost ready. He's almost ready. I can't bring him in the oven. Oh, it's not ready yet. No. That's good. He's thinking about it. No. Yeah. I told him there's not much time left. You can warn him, right? On the phone that showed Dangle with this. Yeah, I can see this. It's good. It's going good. Uh, no, school's out, of course. But, no, I know, um, but I didn't know you out. Yeah, yeah, I had a full year. Okay. Two minutes over. Yeah. <laughs> or not. I might retire. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm hoping. <laughs> she wants me to just whoosh. Be yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. Just getting up early. And, uh, well, no. Not even that. The tire doesn't work. No. This one won't slow down. I mean, yeah, I didn't should be able to do the church and then it's just, just construction, too. Oh. And I'm, I just feel like it's too much. Yeah, it's got three things. I was thinking about having you open up in prayer. I wasn't sure, but maybe next time. I'll get there. <laughs> Do you put that on pause or something? I put, Do you want to try to do the offering for us today? I put... Praise God. It's great to see everybody. Uh, pray that God blesses your life tonight in this uh, ministry here in the song service. Amen. God's spirit visiting us. Amen. I want to also uh, bring to your attention uh, every Sunday morning we have church at 1030. And uh, we have a second service for those online who are not aware of it at uh, 530. For prayer we meet here. And you're welcome to join us in the prayer room if you want to uh, get a hold of God. We'll pray with you and we'll pray for the service. And uh, 6.30 is our evening service. And then on Wednesday, <laughs> on Wednesday we have a midweek service at 7.30. 6.30 is our time of prayer. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, change the order of our service. We're going to take up our offering right now. Praise God. And uh, this is from Second uh, Kings, chapter 5. We're going to read verses 14 through 16 in a moment here. I've entitled this, You Can't Buy a Miracle. That might even be a Steely Dan album, isn't it? <laughs> Can't buy a thrill. <laughs> and he returned to the man of God, and he and all his aides came and stood before him. And he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all of earth. You see, this record is a story or a reference to Naaman the Syrian who has uh, contracted leprosy and so his, 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 his skin has fallen off him. He's a, actually a commander and he comes to Israel because a little maid told him, you know, you should go and let the man of God pray for you and you'll be healed. So he comes to the man of God and the man of God says, go dip in the Jordan seven times and you're going to be healed. 
And so he dips, you know, seven times, and Jody comes up. His skin is like a baby. It's brand new. It's fresh. God gives him a miracle. All that skin that was falling off of him, his nose, his fingers, his body's falling apart. God gave him a miracle. And so look what he does here in the scripture. We read, uh, uh, now I know he's, he is making like a, uh, he's bearing witness. He's saying, I know that there is no other God in earth except for your God because God gave him a miracle. Uh, so please, he says, take a gift from your servant. And uh, the he goes down and uh, his, his flesh is restored. He, but he said, as the Lord lives before I understand, I will receive nothing. So the man of God who healed him, who told him to go down and bathe in the Jordan, he said, I'm not going to take any money from you. You can't pay for a miracle. But the man urged him to take it, but he refused. So we tonight, we're not paying for God to give us miracles. I don't want you to get this wrong. This is not a, uh, some kind of a, a Catholic thing or some kind of blab it and grab it. Or, you, know, you can't pay for a miracle. You can't pay for God to do something extraordinary for He wants to do it. He'll do it out of the goodness of His heart. We give to God because we're investing in eternity. We are paying our tithes out of just uh, 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 an obedience to do what God has required. And the offerings besides, amen, God richly wants to bless you and bring it back to you, but you can't pay for a miracle. Amen, think about it. There's no fee attached to your healing. If you're paralyzed, it's going to cost you $5,000. Put it in the plate, and then we'll pray for you. <laughs> or blindness, 1000 bucks. Maybe deafness, you can't hear out of your left ear, 500 bucks. put it in. We give to God out of gratitude for what he's done. And maybe some people say it's kind of like a seed offering for something that's going to come down the road. Amen. There's no way you can pay for God to do a miracle. You can't pay for it. Can I ask our usher to come forward? He's just going to take our offering for us one time. If you could bring the basket forward. Let's go ahead and pray. Close your eyes with me and say, Lord, we thank you so much for our finances, God, and we're asking you to take this uh, as a token. We pay our tithes and offerings. Besides, I believe that you're going to bless every individual who gives. Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead. You want to sing that song? Let's sing this song together with our sister. Amen. Praise God. When this life is scriptures and everything that goes up uh, meant to help us to worship God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians 4. We're going to read 11 through 15, excuse me, 16 in a short minute here. The self-help industry is a multi-billion dollar industry it fills bookstores and conference rooms. It makes media celebrities out of the people and the capitalized wildly upon off the growing self-consciousness of recent generations. And although it's changed the lives of millions of people, mostly for the better, I assume, this writer shares with us, it still lacks a certain credibility with most Many regard it as simply snake oil. Others laugh at the bizarre superstitions that get passed off as legitimate life advice. Many try self-help, but they, they're left out feeling disgruntled. 
And I want to look at this uh, concept of self-help uh, and, uh, you know, trying to fix yourself, trying to work on, uh, uh, you know, different aspects of your life uh, without God. It's, it's impossible, really. I mean, God's created you, correct? Mm -hmm. He's made you. He's brought you into existence. He's seen every single day uh, of your life. He was there when you got pushed over on the playground, right? When you were dunked you in the pool. I don't know. I'm the younger one and I got dunked a few times. I'll never forget that. But God has seen everything you've ever been involved in. And he knows the pain. He knows how twisted you're in your mind. And he has an ability to uh, unravel that, amen, and help you to be healed in your heart. And uh, so he is the focus of our attention. Uh, Amanda Fielding, a UK native, from the start, she was interested in how to access deeper parts of her consciousness. So listen to me for a minute here. She arrived uh, at what she considered an answer, the effects of LSD. So here's this girl. She's experimenting with different methods of self-consciousness and self-awareness. Uh, <clears throat> She experiments with other methods of brain alignment, including trepanation. Does anybody know what trepanation is? It is an old uh, technique where they drill a, a hole in your skull. Um, they've done it for thousands of years. You can see it in some of the uh, ancient civilizations uh, and the mummies and the different uh, things they found in the pyramids. But it's a technique that she decided to try for herself. In 1970, Fielding decided to perform the procedure on herself in order to increase a blood circulation to the brain, despite lack of medical evidence. She recorded herself. I imagine you could go online. Maybe it's not there, but if she videotaped it, that would be interesting. She drilled a hole in her forehead. Blood spurting from the wound she had numbed with a local anesthetic. And the footage was screened at some gallery in New York in 1978 and caused audience members to faint, you think? Yeah. I would think, I would faint. She later told Wired in 2018 that she had no regrets about the operation. And she implored the scientific community to research it further. She even underwent trepanation a second time, yeah. albeit with someone else doing the drilling. Imagine trying to uh, <laughs> to operate on yourself. I mean, there's countless examples that I found, but I just decided to use this one. She decides to operate on her brain to get better circulation, and so she does it on her own. Hey Amen. Let's just, I know it sounds ridiculous, but a lot of people, they really do try to fix their problems without consulting God, without praying about it, without asking God, God, I need you to help me. I need your solution. And so that's where a lot of people get in trouble. People turn to drugs, narcotics, uh, drinking or immoral relationships, trying to fix their innermost problems. And the answer is here. We find it in Scripture. We find it in the church and through uh, different forms of ministry. Let's Read our scripture. This is Ephesians 4, verses 11. And he himself gave some to the church, I inserted that, to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That means the strengthening putting on muscle mass, like you're at the gym. Until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by different uh, winds of doctrine, by trickery of men, and in the cunningness and craftiness of uh, Deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. 
and causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Man, leave it up to the experts, is what I've entitled this sermon. And it was generated from a time me and my son were painting this giant house in the city, right? Like a three-story with the dormers up and, you know, it's just, just a giant house. So next door, we're talking to uh, him. The homeowner had to move his car so we could paint. And so we were talking about, you know, you know cutting trees down. Very interesting topic because uh, a lot of people try to do it on their own. And they get in some serious trouble. He said, no, I say, you just leave it up to the experts. And when I heard that, it just like turned into this sermon. It was just so incredible to uh, think about this concept of trying to fix things by yourself without having the expertise or the knowledge or the ability to, uh, you know, do something. Don't try to fix things on your own is this whole the pivot of this, 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 this sermon that I'm about to preach to you. Don't, don't try to get involved in a project that is beyond your skill level, that is beyond, beyond your ability or your experience. Like, uh, you know, maybe changing wires in your house. As we can see, it turned out to be a huge fail by this man right here. As you see, he's, he's not really uh, getting somebody else to help him who has the expertise. A, a lady contacted me today. She wants us to work on her house. And she said, uh, do you have any uh, uh, experience with plumbing? And so and this is kind of a touchy thing. She says, you know, any experienced plumber. So like there are certain things that I will do and certain things that I need to leave up to the experts. Amen. Because I don't want to see this lady's ceiling, you know, flooding with water and falling down as she's eating dinner. So we're going to leave that one up to the experts, I believe. Amen, because when you get involved in things, in difficult situations, you're trying to do some kind of a, a project, amen, it could lead to the worst scenario. It could become more than a teaching opportunity for you, but it could be dangerous, whether it's changing an outlet or an electrical fuse box. It could be actually life and death. It could be you know, more than just a joking matter as we're kind of having a little fun with it tonight. As you can see in the image. Amen. Cutting down very tall trees can also end in disaster. And I have had experience of doing that on a few occasions. It's very frightening when you have tons of wood and it could fall uh, on a fence or out of the garage. And, you know, one time we, my, me and my son, you know, this was 20 years ago, we helped the church to cut down this evergreen that was, you know, just, you know, just in the wrong place. And so we thought we could do it. We ch started chopping it and it fell the wrong way. It fell on the electrical wires. A friend of mine, we need to leave it up to the experts. Amen. That's that Atlantic amen. Avenue. Oh, boy. And thankfully, amen, nobody got electrocuted. Nobody died. Although we were <laughs> working double time to, to clean off the branches and get it out of the way and free up the line. Leave it up to the experts. Maybe thinking for a moment here, if you're in a, a problem in your life, man, you know, am I in over my head? Am I getting involved in something that I can't fix, that I cannot repair? And if anything is to become uh, highly aware of the severity of the operation and how dangerous it could be and maybe just wasting your time. Maybe you can't really help yourself. Maybe for every homeowner, they should probably just simply quit before somebody gets hurt and just leave it up to the experts. Get on the phone and call, so call a professional. You've seen, you know, the Pink Rose ads. We do this many times with our life too, and I know this is kind of an extensive introduction, but we try to fix our lives with, uh, you know, what other people suggest. There's so many people in our lives that will give advice. Oh, you need to drop her. Oh, you need to get rid of him, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, why don't you try this or, you know, try some weed or maybe try, a, try this acid. You know, we're going to party and it, it'll make every, every, every pain that you're suffering and now just go away. Just have it. Come on, have a drink with me. Meet me down at uh, some, uh, the Penny Arcade uh, down on Lake Avenue and we'll just party. We'll forget about the fact that your wife is leaving you. You know, the world has all kinds of answers to fix your problems and people love to give advice. 
that are not really equipped to give advice. They're not aware of who you really are, and they're not aware of you know how to fix you. They don't have the answers. Amen. Some people say, oh, I, I can figure it out. I've been here once before, and, and this is how I dealt with it, and I got through it, and I'm going to do the same thing now. The problem is it didn't work then. It's not going to work now also at a later time in a different situation, whether it's marital strife or marital problems, finances or relationship issues. I got my own ideas on how to solve this problem. So, I'll leave it up to my natural instincts and my natural impulses and hopefully, you know, everything will work out in the end and nobody will get hurt too badly. The problem is that your marriage can end in divorce because you haven't really looked at your spouse through the eyes of what the Bible teaches the way we should treat each other. Spouse, husband, wife, making God the you know, integral part of your life. The two shall become one flesh and the Bible teaches that a threefold cord is not easily broken. And so if you're going to forget about God, uh, good luck to you, buddy. I feel really sorry for you. I'm going to pray for you, but you can't fix your own life on your own. You need spiritual help. You need uh, to find out what the Bible teaches, and you need to be equipped firstly. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Uh, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists like Ralph Blanco, who was here last week. Some pastors is my function. I also function as a teacher. And I have a pastor also, Pastor Keith Sullivan, who is, uh, has much wisdom and common sense in things that I can't see happening. He's able to help me. And he has a pastor also who's able to help him. Because we need to be equipped for the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the strengthening of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, God has planned to give the gifts that the church needs. And that is gifting people who will be able to help us, people that are above us. Firstly, the gifts to the church are the apostles. And mainly that would be the twelve, uh, the first disciples. Amen. They were apostles. They had seen the Lord Jesus. These were men who were uh, serving with Jesus. They were preaching. They were learning how to pray for the sick. They were the apostles, the original 12. And then we have an addition to that, Paul, uh, who nicknamed himself an apostle who was born out of due time because he wasn't really there. But he did have an experience on the road to Damascus when he was knocked off his uh, uh, Keister right there and landed on the ground and fell to the floor. Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He had an experience with God. He actually spent some time in the wilderness and communed with the Holy Spirit and God gave him revelation. He became an, an unusual and an additional apostle. Galatians 1, 1 says, a Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And to all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace, peace unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians, Paul says he had a revelation, uh, a vision of the resurrected Jesus who commissioned him to become an apostle. This is a gift that the church has given us. And we can see that the Bible... Uh, many of you might have a, a, a physical Bible that uh, most of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. Why? For the edifying, for the building up, for the strengthening of your life, for the helping of this church to grow and be established. Paul said he received a vision. And this was crucial for Paul as he was leading uh, the church in terms of his authority. Many ministers today, you can go online and you can find many men who are ministers who call themselves apostles, and I dare say they are not apostles. Amen. They might brag that they have an incredible ministry and hundreds of thousands of, of people who follow them, but they're not apostles. Amen. Very dangerous. 
to call yourself to something when you're just a fake. Secondly, God gives the church prophets. Prophets, uh, according to the Bible, were men and women at times who prophesied something, who spoke and uh, uh, revealed something that was going to come in the future. And if that prophetic utterance did not happen, then God said, stone them. This is the Old Testament. You can't relate to that, maybe. This is not your culture. This is the Old Testament. And they stoned them when they tried to prophesy. And they were making stuff up. They were lying. Their calling produced fruit. And there were miracles. And there were healings and other amazing phenomena. There were supernatural events that occurred when the prophet was praying for people. Many people got healed of their sickness. People were raised from the dead. Miracles occurred. Calling yourself a prophet might get you stoned. So I'm going to encourage you to think about this. If you're going to call yourself a prophet, third is the evangelist. This is somebody who travels around. Amen. And they might go from a church to another church. And they might uh, uh, evangelize uh, uh, different uh, states or countries. Maybe they go overseas. In our fellowship, we have evangelists who are employed. They travel uh, to other churches for usually one or two weeks at a time. They go and preach. And then they come back home and they're inserted back into their mother church where they can get, you know, reestablished and be fed and visit with their family and take care of chores. And then, bam, they're back out again on the road uh, for another job. Amen. Ralph Blanco was extremely helpful to me in this church. He visited here. We had four uh, outrageous, wonderful services where we were engaged with the Holy Spirit. The presence of God fell upon us. And Ralph was ministering. People were getting saved. Uh, we had visitors. Uh, it was an exciting place, an exciting time. And uh, he ministered. People got healed in their bodies also. And I pray that you, if you didn't see any of the uh, sermons, you can go online and you can be partakers of that to helpfully bless your life. Amen. He ministered as an expert. Because why? He has seen, uh, as a pastor, he uh, had pastored many churches, and he had seen failures, he had seen mistakes, and he had seen what works, what doesn't work. Amen. And he believes God, amen, to help us also a godly perspective and an anointed way of ministering and teaching and preaching and sharing expert information so that this church can grow and we can be helped, amen, as we were. And fourthly, there's pastors. Having a pastor is a little bit like having a shepherd. God talks to us like we are sheep. We're the sheep of his pasture, and this is not to, to demean anybody here, but sheep are stupid. You know, sheep need a shepherd or they're going uh, to fall off a cliff. They're going to wander. They're going to be eating over here in this field and not recognize that the whole flock is left. They're going to be left behind for the wolves who will eat them for lunch. And the job of a pastor is to protect the sheep, amen, protect the people in his uh, congregation, Man, the shepherd's job, you know, leading the sheep to green pastures where they can be healthy, uh, taking care of them, and uh, maybe training them so that they can be healthy and productive. The pastor becomes a covering for a congregation. It becomes a covering for the people in his church. I have a covering. I have my pastor, Pastor Keith Sullivan. That's why we're always praying for him. He's my covering, and... Uh, I am your covering here as pastor in this church to protect you. <clears throat> Some people have a mindset, hey man, I don't need a church. I don't need a pastor to protect me. I got this figured out. I'm all set. I don't need a church to fellowship with. But as we learned this morning, amen, we have fellowship together with God the Father and God the Son and with, amen, the church is how we are going to be helped and protected and become 
fruitful in our lives. If a pastor has been pastoring any length of time, he is going to be able to help us to become successful Christians. Hence the need for an expert. Amen. Sinners all the time, you know, we, they try to figure life out. They try to fix themselves. You know, amen. And Christians do the same thing. They might try to, you know, fix their own problems by their own merit, their own strength, their own abilities. I got a Bible. I can read. You know, I'm not stupid. But there's something wonderful that God has put in place uh, to be in our lives to help us to learn about the Bible, to become disciples, and he's called a pastor in your life. If you're the kind of person who say, I don't need anybody telling me what to do, that can be very dangerous. A wise pastor is not going to tell people, you know what you should do? This, this, and this. Because if this, this, and that uh, become a failure in their life, the person's going to be like, well, you told me to do that. A pastor would never, you know, any wise man would never do that. So a pastor's job is to let things be seen, uh, show how things are going to play out. If you choose A, then this is going to happen. And there's a little bit of experience that I have, if I can help you in any way to give you uh, examples, to give you suggestions, and to help you to see uh, making that choice, that's not a good idea. Why? Because A, B, and C. So it's a practical thing. And I'm going to talk to you right here and insert in this sermon uh, the, uh, the opportunity that you have. You have a pastor to help you. You can go to him. You can come to me and ask questions. And it's just quite likely that I might have something that can help you. That one was for free tonight. I would never really want to tell you what to do. Amen. If God shows you tonight through preaching and through this ministry what you should do, that's where God gets the glory or you're reading your Bible. And God showed you something. Pastor, I can't believe I found this in the Bible. And it's glorious. That's how God will be glorified in your life. He's going to help you. Amen. Trying to fix yourself is impossible. <clears throat> and some of you have used drugs for years. Some of you have been on the bottle uh, for uh, generations. You've been drinking. You've been trying to solve your own problem. Well, my mom and dad did it this way. I'm going to do the same thing. Well, look where it got them. Or your friends, they give you all kinds of advice. Why not find out what the Bible teaches and let God fix you through the preaching, through your pastor, through other people in this church, amen? If you say, hey man, I don't need any help, this can set you up for pride. This can set you up for failure and destruction. You separate yourself from other people. Amen. Scripture says in Proverbs uh, that the wise man seeks counsel. Wisdom is found in the counsel of many people, right? So you're going to ask the professionals. You're going to uh, go to the expert for advice. We need to understand that it's the pastor's desire not to control people. I'm not looking to tell you what to do with your life. It's not a thrill, be honest with you. I've got my own life to deal with. But God wants to help you in your life. Amen. So that you can be fixed and helped and uh, produce much fruit in your life. Grow and be matured and bear fruit. Is anybody here? Huh? Can anybody hear me? I don't want to control your life. I want you to be helped through this preaching, yeah. through the gospel, through scriptures, and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Discipleship is a process which happens when a disciple brings himself underneath a pastor and desires to learn. This is the kind of Christian who's like, you know, I'm very happy to be saved. I'm very glad that I'm in the church. I'm going to be faithful to the services and I'm going to honor God. But I want more. I want to, to please God. I want to grow. I want to make an impact in my generation. I want to have a breakthrough in my life. That person is going to uh, become disciple. They want to learn. The standard lexicon for New York, uh, excuse me, New Testament Greek 
defines the word disciple, um, mathetes, as one who gauges in learning through instruction from another. In other words, a pupil or an apprentice. A learner. That's our uh, word we use here in America. Amen. At its most basic meaning, the word disciple means learner. And what kind of learning does Jesus intend his disciples he wanted to learn them to love God with all their hearts and to love their neighbor. Amen. Love your enemies. Jesus taught them many things. He imparted many things to them. He taught them how to pray for the sick. He sent out the 70. When they returned, they said, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And they were healing people. And they were casting out the evil spirits. They were learning. They were taught. You and I, seventhly, we all need to become learners. That's the heart. Uh, uh, that's the sign of a good, uh, you know, life that, you know, you don't think you've arrived. You don't think you know the Bible. You don't think you know all about life. Amen. And you're willing. You're humble enough to ask for help. You're humble enough to ask, wow, can you help me to figure this out? We need to be learners. Even I have a pastor. Pastor Keith Sullivan can still uh, correct me. Pastor Sullivan can direct me and rebuke me at times and help me so that I can become a better uh, pastor. I can become a better husband, a better um, you know, leader here in the church, a better preacher perhaps. No one has arrived. Right. None of us are perfect. Can you say amen? We are all in a constant state of of renewal and learning and growing. Amen. And it's glorious. We're all called to be disciples and learners. Fifthly, there's teachers. Something else that God's given the church. And sometimes, you know, you might have, uh, uh, you know, your pastor enters into the teaching realm where uh, we've been able to do uh, Sunday school. If anybody's interested in uh, Bible studies, we can still do those, amen, and we can sit down and we can talk about uh, what the scriptures mean, and there's always an opportunity to teach uh, and uh, learn from scripture. First Corinthians 12, verse 28, and God has appointed these in the church first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and uh, after that, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. God wants to add to your life. And he's making ways so that you can amen, learn and grow. Amen. God desires to help us. And he wants us to become fruitful. That's his desire. We can learn from teachers and pastors as they show us how to live. Teaching us what the Bible means. And learning. Showing us what life can be like as we obey the Spirit of God. And follow scriptures. Secondly... And that we need to be equipped because, why? There's a war going on. Amen. There's a war for your soul. There are enemies that are against you. Amen. We need to learn how to wage a good warfare. We need to learn how to be trained and be equipped. Amen. Because obviously we're lacking things. Amen. When I was a hippie, I would uh, smoke weed and go hide in the basement and uh, jam on my guitar for hours. And, and when I became a Christian, I needed to learn how to talk to people. Amen. And my wife, I give her credit for bringing me out of my shell. She taught me a lot of things about having a personality. Can you say amen? I needed to learn how to relate to people and talk to people. And that took a while. But God wants to equip you for the ministry so that you can talk to people, so that you can help other people. Amen? God's going to bring you out of your shell, as it were. And we can get involved in church at some level. All of us can learn how to minister. We can all learn how to encourage each other. Praise God. Thank God that He's got something for you. It's not so important who you are today. But think about who you will become in the future. Down the road, God is going to use your life incredibly and help you to minister to other people. It's something that, it doesn't come natural, believe me. 
Uh, some people love to talk, but for me, it wasn't natural. I had to learn how to talk. I had to learn how to communicate with people and to connect with them. Amen. It works against the flesh. That equipping means that some things are going to be added to our lives. As we do what? As we study the Word of God, as we pray, and as we hear good preaching, and as we hear good teaching, God is going to uh, instruct us and equip us so that we can be fruitful and bless this church. Bless people in your lives. Bring people to the knowledge of Christ. People in your family, people on your job. Uh, will be helped and will be brought to, uh, to know Jesus. Amen. Let's look at the winds of doctrine, secondly. And those are dangerous teachings that will keep you from uh, uh, being successful. Verse 14 reads that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And then there's many doctrines out there that are not of God and that are going to lead you away from His will. Many doctrines. All of us are called to become fruitful and we are called to maturity. Yeah. And then growing up spiritual. Becoming spiritually minded instead of you know, fleshing out and saying whatever comes out of your mouth. We're called to become mature and learn how to speak, how to react, how to process life differently. And God promises to help you to become aware of those different winds of doctrine that are very, yeah, they're very detrimental. They're going to kill your fruitfulness. There's false doctrines. And he likens it to the wind blowing, amen, up here in this plaza there's a lot of wind that blows back and forth. You've been here in the winter, maybe you've seen that door slam up against the railing. Um, the other day, that must have been yesterday, we were coming back from Syracuse, there was some enormous wind gusts. And we were on the thruway. But when I got back here at night, I came to the church, our side had blown over. And you know, I bought some giant cinder blocks to hold the sign from tipping over. It still blew over because Winds of doctrine can cause us to fail, amen, can do uh, much damage. That blowing back and forth all over the place is the picture that he's using here of teachings that uh, are not stable, they're not solid. It's an illusion that draws attention to the concept of false doctrine like it's a dried leaf that's blowing in the wind. It goes wherever the... Uh, the, the wind blows it. And then it's like a fad that comes through the church world. We see many fads, many false doctrines that we have to be aware of. You can go online and you can find all kinds of false teachers. You can find all kinds of false doctrine. Amen. And it's like a, a wind that is going to be blowing you back and forth unless you are rooted and grounded. There's the prosperity doctrine. Don't you know God wants you to be rich and happy? Did he ever tell you that? No. <laughs> the Bible reads a little bit differently. It's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. And I'm not going to preach doom and bloom, gloom, <laughs> doom and gloom, but I am trying to say that, you know, there's doctrines, like that prosperity doctrine, just believe it and it'll happen, just blab it and grab it, right? There's all kinds of tricks and it's just not really what the Bible shows us. You have to be very careful about what you're learning. LGBTQ doctrine is infiltrating the church. It's getting in to where it really does not belong. There are certain fads and bizarre political ideologies that are leaking into the church that grade against what the Bible teaches. We have to be very careful about false doctrines. We have to uh, find out what the expert has to say, my friend. Here's the expert. We have to leave it up to the expert. Amen. To fix the problems that are going on in the world. Amen. These infiltration, these influences from outside that are trying to get in the church, they want to express themselves 
They want to manifest themselves. They're like certain demon spirits. They want to warm flesh. They want to, to um, you know, propose all kinds of crazy ideas. They want your children. They want to get a hold of and indoctrinate your children and my children in the public school district. In uh, different uh, media, uh, different posts, you can see different um, social media uh, attempts to indoctrinate our children, and it's doing a very good job of it. There's another doctrine, a false doctrine, or a doctrine that's like a fad, that let's just worship uh, worship some more and worship until we're blue in the face. Sing, 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 sing endlessly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, we believe in singing, but there's a certain point. It's not going to be a rock concert in here. It's not going to have, you know, we're not going to have a smoke and mirrors and, uh, you know, light, a great light show. This might not be the Father's house. It might not be some amazing mega church, right? We're not going to go overboard with the music. But fifthly, if we study the Bible, the Bible will teach us the truth so that we will not be duped or fooled or deceived. Amen. In believing things that are not of God. The Bible reveals to us what is important for living a godly life and becoming fruitful. And the Bible, lastly, is the Word of God. We can rely upon it. Amen. Self-help fails. Self-help fails because we are not approaching change, one man writes here, in the correct way for our current circumstances and underlying personality. We're not doing what works. We're not in a place to be able to have other priorities and not are ready to hunker down and sort it out. Amen. There's plenty of self-help books out there that you can buy or you can order online, get it on Amazon, right? But it's really not going to help you if you're going to try to fix yourself. If it's not Bible-based, it's going to be like you're going to be, you're going to be, it's going to feel like you're banging your, your head up against a wall. You're not going to be really getting anywhere. They have different values. Many people uh, have different beliefs and different focuses. And there will be different outcomes that are sought after. Amen. Let's look lastly at obtaining, amen, help so that we can be fruitful. Edification brings fruitfulness. Our scripture says here, if we leave it up to the experts, that we are going to flourish. And I want you to know, the Bible says that if, if any man desires to be a teacher or or, you know, be some kind of leader in the church. You're like entering into something. You are doubly accountable for your life and for what you say and what you teach and, and how you pastor, amen. It's not something quick that a man should enter into. Amen. This truth must be sought after. It's our responsibility as Christians. Every individual in here should be reading your Bible. You should be studying. You should be involved in... in uh, you know, getting a, a handle on what the Bible teaches. When we trust our leadership, we trust our pastors, then we will truly be brought into our destiny. And then don't think that a pastor is looking to lord it over you and control you and, uh, you know, be macho dude and try to, you know, force you into doing something you don't want to do. That's not his, that's not his will at all. That's not his desire. And I want you to know that your pastor will help you to be edified. And through that edification, through you being built up, you will become fruitful. And you will be blessed and you will become a blessing to other people. Proverbs 1.5, a wise man will hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Proverbs 1.5, instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. Proverbs 9, 9. Amen. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. I understand that Jesus, and surely you will say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. The proverb appears to have been in common use in the Roman Empire in 70 AD. Given that it is referred to as 
such in the Gospel of Luke and translated in the King James Bible. Attend to your own defects before presuming to advise others about theirs. Amen. Remove uh, the log that is in your own eye before you attempt to uh, remove the log that is in your, uh, the, not the log, but the uh, little sliver or the speck that is in your brother's eye. Amen. We count it a privilege to pastor here, my wife and I, as we've been laboring. And we are uh, looking so forward to the fruit that's going to come in your life as you continue to uh, attend church and be pastored by us and through us here. This is a holy covenant, a holy spiritual relationship that God has given you and I together so that you can produce fruit, so that you will be edified. So those who come on Sunday morning that are not here right now, and those who come on Wednesday night that maybe you haven't met yet, those people, amen, that are waiting in the wings, they're going to come here, amen, and people that are not saved yet will be born again here, and we will all come to the knowledge of Jesus, and we will be edified, amen. I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus. If you're not saved tonight and you're not here in the sanctuary, maybe you're online or maybe you've backslidden, you have uh, taken your inheritance from your heavenly Father and you've squandered it and you've wasted much money, you've wasted much precious time and you, you know, it's like you spit on your Father's grave. You said, I don't need God anymore. And you have been living prodigally. You're wasting. You're just out there. You're away from God. You want to repair that relationship with God. You want to come back into your father's house. You want to, you know, correct your relationship with God. How many would there be tonight? You're not saved or you're backslidden. You're out of fellowship or you need prayer. Amen. I see people. Would anybody like to pray? And get right with Jesus. Amen. Praise God. All across the room. Amen. Front to back. God is here for us. And uh, discipline is not to kill you, to destroy you, but the discipline is to make you better. And not to just punish you for punishment's sake, but to bring a maturity to your life so that when you grow up, you will be mature. You will be fruitful. You will be the man or the woman of God that he desires you to become. Strengthen. Amen. You're not saved and you're backslidden. You'd like to come to Christ tonight. Amen. Give your heart back to Jesus. Amen. Praise God. That's you online. You'd like to pray. Amen. You feel God's tugging at your heart. You're ready to stop trying to do it your own way. You're ready to let the Father heal you. Let Christ's blood wash you clean. And that's you tonight. You want to pray. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. That is to bow your heart before the Lord. And say this prayer with me. And believe it in your heart. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for trying to fix myself. I thank you for the blood of Christ. I thank you for the completed work of the cross. I know it's not by works of goodness. I know it is by you and your blood and the cross. And I thank you for everlasting life. Fix my broken heart right now. I thank you for that. Give me repentance. Change my mind. Let me turn away from my old life and make me brand new. Make me a new creation. I thank you for this prayer and I thank you for your love. Bless me tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's change the order of the service. Amen. And sing this song together. I'm going to open up the altars if you'd like to come forward and just talk to Jesus.
You have a way for me to walk in. For thus says the Lord your God tonight, I will take care of you. My will is for you to prosper. My will is for you to grow in Christ. For I have great plans that I have uh, uh, planned for you. And that your fruit will remain. And that you will grow and you will grow in knowledge uh, and yes in knowledge your knowledge will be turned uh, into action and your faithfulness and your fruitfulness will uh, bear much more fruit and you will grow and you will uh, be blown away you will astound even your enemies they will have nothing to say against you for I am a good God and I plan to make you the head and not the tail and I will bring you into a promised land, a realm of fruitfulness and dominion. You will not be tricked or deceived. You will not be intimidated by the enemy. For I have a great plan to equip you and to mature you and to cause you to annihilate your enemies and be fruitful and grow in Christ. For I have planned these things. I have great intentions and a great heart for you. For I've been thinking about you mm -hmm. and I've been uh, planning for your heart uh, to uh, be exposed and, and to be healed and to grow. And I've set uh, uh, members in this body right here, in this church for its edification and for its strengthening. Call on me and cry out to me and I will answer your prayers. And I will speak to you very plainly. Mm. And I will direct your paths. Thus says the Lord your God tonight. These people, amen. 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 Hallelujah. God, thank you, Lord, that you're going to do great things. God, you're concerned about us. You love us, God. Oh, thank God for His Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going to close right now. I want to thank you for coming. Amen. We're going to ask you, amen, to uh, keep us in prayer. We're going to be back again on this Wednesday night. If you'd like to uh, watch any of the uh, Ralph Blanco videos, they're online. 
and uh, it was a great time that we had together. Um, we're going to also remind you about Saturday. We're going to be on outreach. We're going to go into the local community and tell other people about Jesus. Let's go ahead and bow our hearts before the Lord. God, we thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. God, thank you for this sermon. God, touch our lives. God, help us to grow. Direct us and speak to us through your word, God. Help us to know that we are covered and protected right now. God, bring fruit. And I pray personally for those three brothers who prayed last night and for a man by the name of Elias. God, bring him here to church. God, I pray. Help us to uh, please you. Help us to believe you. God, help us to call out to you, God, and to bear much fruit in our lives. We thank you. Keep us safe and bring us back uh, on Wednesday. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. You're blessed. And, uh, and praise God. Have a good night. <laughs>